of our faith, uh, which Yeshua fulfilled. And, um, and we've reached this time after uh, seven weeks of Sabbaths and from Passover, and it's just flown, hasn't it? It's really flown, flown. But it is a time as well when we look at the law and we read the law. So at the beginning of the service, when Keith read the Torah and uh, Les and Don as, as elders uh, lifted the loaves, I just felt that was an honoring of God and uh, a, a proclamation, really, that we are um, celebrating this feast with him and we are uh, celebrating his uh, um, manifestation of the Holy Spirit. So we'll look at some aspects of the, of the um, Shavuot today and what the Leviticus says about that. I'm going to get Marion to read for us if she's there, is she? She's there. I'm not yet Marion, but I'll give you a shout in a moment if that's all right. But I've been looking at the law for a long time now, for many years, and I'm going back now to research some of the uh, conventicles acts and some of the people who were taken to court because they kept Sabbath, Saturday Sabbath instead of Sunday. I'm looking at the, uh, the Act of Uniformity, which is dated in 1549, when the Anglican Church took the authority from the Catholic Church in Great Britain and had a court in Chester, would you believe, in the cathedral in Chester. Has anybody seen the consistory court? In Chester, it's still there, Pauline. Yeah, I know, I've seen it. It's just amazing, isn't it? And I'm looking at the archives. So t on Tuesday, I spent Tuesday in the archives looking at, you know, who had been um, prosecuted under the Consistory Act, which is the Ecclesiastic uh, Act uh, um, that the church uses to uh, admonish clergy, but also admonish people in the congregation. So... Um, I wanted to just acknowledge some of the disciplines that the Consistory Act uh, gave to clergy, and I wanted to present some of the evidence to Keith and Keith and to Jane so that they could understand the importance of their behavior within a congregation. So what I'm going to do is first I'm going to ask you, Jane, if you would just open that up for me. Because these are records that I took from the archives on Tuesday about behavior within a congregation. And um, it gives the name and the date of uh, the offense and when they went to the consistory court in Chester. And Jane, I want you to read that, that item, that case that was brought before the bishops in the consensory court in Chester in 1636. Can you read that? Um, Peter, Morris, Peter Morris of Harden, for wandering out of church during div, presumably divine, divine service, service, 4th of our August, 1636. Right, and what I'd like you to do, Jane, is to honour the consistory court and don't get convicted of that offence ever again. Okay, so I'm going to take that, you, I want you to take that with you, right, and put it on the wall, and what are you going to learn from that? Um, to cross my legs tight. <laughs> <laughs> right, not to wander around in the service. Okay, right, so sit down and behave yourself, okay, right. But this time, Ed, I want you to come out because I want you to present these two men with something because um, it's quite a serious offence. It was actually um, the wardens that actually um, gave the evidence to the consistory court and to the bishops. So I want to make sure that these guys actually know what's going on and, and that we have some evidence of service. Don't open it up. They can open it up. But if you'll oh. present them with it. Who? Keith and Keith. Keith and Keith? Yeah. Just for you, sir. Thank you. And for you. Okay. Thank so, you. gentlemen, can you open those up? And then can you read what it says in case 191? And, what, and read the whole case or the indictment. It's that one. Thomas Fox of Broadlays for sleeping during divine service. 
23rd of October, 1637. Right. Keith? It's 191. You're reading the same thing, but I want to make sure you know about it. Uh, no comments. <laughs> Thomas Fox of Broadlease for sleeping during divine service, 23rd of October, 1637. Right. Well, Ed, you served them with this notice, haven't you? They understand that under the Consistory Act, right, that you can't sleep during a divine service. Ever. So that is the last time. Is that right? That's, right? That's the last time that we'll do that. Otherwise, we'll have you in Chester Court in the cathedral before you can turn around. Is that fair? Right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. Yeah. <laughs> the person who this was meant for is not here. I'm going to deliver it to her personally. Because I won't tell you who it is, but she lives just down the road from me. <laughs> well, the, 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 the uh, Feast of Shavuot is a beautiful feast, and it's a great celebration. And we've got a celebration after uh, here, because we are uh, uh, collecting for Myanmar, for the children in Myanmar, who have got no water at the moment, or fresh water. Um, it, it's very hot in uh, the district that this orphanage is in, and they, they haven't got fresh water, so um, we're going to give them some money to dig a well or drill a well so they can have fresh water close to them. They can go for fresh water, but it's a long way away. And they uh, and called the pastor, emailed Shirley the other day and said, this is the situation there. So, so Shirley's cooked a meal, which is similar to the meal that they have when we send them money at one of these feasts. So um, if you'll stay for a meal after and if you'll uh, donate to the meal, then we can send that money off to uh, Myanmar and hopefully it'll get there. We had a bit of a blip on, uh, on Thursday because we were notified by Western Union that somebody had illegally tried to take 500 pounds out of our account uh, because Shirley's transferring money through Western Union and... Um, and anyway, somebody had falsely tried to do that, so we had to cancel cards and things on Thursday. But, uh, but you'll get it to them, won't you, somehow? Yeah, you'll probably take it, will you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But also, uh, Fran Coyne was here last week. Wasn't she lovely? Wasn't she just, she is an adorable woman. She's just absolutely lovely and passionate about God. But we forgot to take a collection for her. So if any of you want to give particularly to Fran, then can you see Carol next Saturday and um, just give a donation to Fran and we'll transfer it over to her in Israel. Um, we did give her a gift from the church, but it would be nice if you specifically wanted to give her something, then you could do that. Um, so... Marion, can you come and, and read Leviticus 23, I think it is, is it? I'm not sure you know. I'm not sure, I don't know. Anyway, you know the scripture. That's why I've got Marion to read it, because I don't know what it is. Yes. Oh, yeah, have you got the mic, yeah, Keith, please? Yeah, we put it there to keep him awake. <laughs> You'll give start, me some stick after. If I'll I start you. shouting, I'll start coughing. Yeah, okay. Uh, reading from the New Revised Standard Version, Leviticus 23, 15 to 22. And from the day after the Sabbath, from the day on which you bring the sheaf of the elevation offering, you shall count off seven weeks. They shall be complete. You shall count until the day after the seventh Sabbath, 50 days. Then you shall present an offering of new grain to the Lord. You shall bring from your settlements two loaves of bread as an elevation offering, each made of two-tenths of an ephah. They shall be of choice flour, baked with leaven as first fruits to the Lord. You, you shall present with the bread seven lambs a year old without blemish, one young bull and two rams. 
they shall be a burnt offering to the Lord, along with their grain offering and their drink offerings, an offering by fire of pleasing odor to the Lord. You shall also offer one male goat for a sin offering and two male lambs a year old as a sacrifice of well-being. The priest shall raise them with the bread of the first fruits as an elevation offering before the Lord, together with the two lambs. They shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. On that same day, you shall make proclamation. You shall hold a, co a holy convocation. You shall not work at your occupations. This is a statute forever in all your settlements throughout your generations. Then when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the alien. I am the Lord your God. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. I'll give Keith that back. Thanks, Keith. Thank you. So that's the scripture in Leviticus which instructs us to keep this particular feast. And this feast comes seven weeks after uh, Passover, after unleavened bread. And, and, and it's a feast that Jews attended. They, after Passover, they went home. They went back to their families. And then they traveled again to Jerusalem. And uh, while we were in Crete, you, Keith looked at um, the history of the Jewish people in Crete, didn't you? And, and it was clear. It's clear from the scripture in, in the book of Acts anyway that people came from Crete to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast. And they came three times a year. The Passover convocation, the Feast of Weeks convocation, and then tabernacles. It was a long way to, for them to travel to celebrate the feast, but they wanted to honor God. They really wanted to honor God with all their hearts. And, and they wanted to do what God asked them and to keep the precepts that God had given them in Leviticus 23 and the whole of the, the Torah, the five books of Moses. So, so they traveled that distance and they came with offerings and and they came and, and went to the temple and celebrated. And it would have been a big social event as well. It would have been a time when they'd have had a really uh, good time of celebrating the feast, but also meeting each other because they'd have got friendships with each other, wouldn't they? And people from different parts of, of, uh, of uh, the Middle East. And, and Asia Minor would have come together and celebrated. And, and it's, it's nice for us to have Terry and Mo today. They've come from the other side of Birmingham. It is, isn't it? North of Birmingham. North of Birmingham to be with us today. So it's that kind of thing. So we want to welcome you, Terry and Mo, traveling so far to celebrate with us. But it's just, and Malcolm has come from Stoke as well, and he's come all this way. So. Stourbridge, sorry. There we are. It's all the same to me. It's the Midlands, isn't it? It's like people say you come from Wales. Well, Wales is a big place, but it's the same, but it's the Midlands. So anyway, you, you, you're all very welcome. And Hugh has come from Aberystwyth. Give, give him a round of applause. So. So it's lovely to see people gathering from all over the place to come and celebrate. And, and, and people have traveled you know, a couple of hours in some cases, an hour in some cases, five minutes or so. <laughs> and some people are late or were late, and I won't name them. <laughs> Don't want you to know who they are. But anyway, but, but it's great to gather together to celebrate a feast, isn't it? And uh, the, the church celebrates it as Pentecost, meaning 50 and... And they focus on many things, but particularly the Holy Spirit, as we do, because we focus on what the Holy Spirit did and, and still is doing today. But we actually recognize this as being a, a Levitical feast, God's one of God's appointed times, and a feast that were, it was fulfilled by Yeshua and something of the Torah, that, the, the laws of God. So it's really important that we celebrate it. And it was celebrated... It was given, sorry, on, uh, in the wilderness to the Jewish people about 3,300 years ago through Moses. And uh, it, this particular uh, uh, feast 
was celebrated certainly in the first century and has been celebrated since the destruction of the temple, probably in the way that we celebrate it today by lifting two loaves because we can't sacrifice sheep here. We haven't got planning permission for that. And, uh, <laughs> and God hasn't given us permission for that either. He says, he says sacrifices must only take place in the temple. The, the, and the temple's been destroyed, so we can't, nobody can sacrifice. And we have a perfect sacrifice, don't we? So that's taken the place of the sheep and the goats. Uh, I think there was one goat, Marion, in your reading of Leviticus that, that, we, that was sacrificed in the temple, but Yeshua is the sacrifice for all. But that doesn't mean that these feasts end in the millennium when he comes back because. The feasts are continued through that, and there will be sacrifices in the temple when he comes back during the millennium period to look back on what he's done. But uh, I wanted to um, look at this feast today in its fullness, but uh, I felt the Lord saying, I thought you were teaching on the Song of Songs. <laughs> and, I, and I thought, well, how does that fit and you know what? Every time I speak on something and then look at the song, it absolutely fits perfectly. Because one of the things that we read in this, it, where I am in the song, because I'm going through the song verse by verse, and, and I know I'm rushing through it, but I, I, but I am looking at, I, 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 we're on Song of Songs 2.9 and then uh, 2.10 today, if we can get through them. But but 2.9 says, my beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag, which is where I taught last time. Look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing in at windows, looking through the lattice. And, and we see in that verse that there's a separation between the maiden and her beloved because he's behind a wall or he's, at, he's outside a wall and she's looking through the lattice. Now, we are Gentiles the majority of us. Some of us are Jews. Some of us don't know whether we're Jews and Gentiles, but some of us, certainly I think the majority would say that they were Gentiles, I think. The majority of us. Uh, because we live in a Gentile nation, don't we? We were born here. Our ancestors are from here, so we are Gentiles. And this particular feast speaks of joining together both Jew and Gentiles, taking down the dividing wall which was in the temple, to prevent the Gentiles entering in to go further. And we see in this feast, when we look at it in depth, that actually the, the, the maiden, who is representing the uh, bride, as Keith had spoken about, and as Becky had, 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 had sang and, and given a word, and that was really powerful. I agree with Keith entirely about that. It really impacted us. It, it, the, the, the maiden being the bride is desperate to come into relationship with her beloved, but there are things between them. There are things that stop her getting close. There's a wall, there's a separation. And, and you know, that separation only comes, only is destroyed by Yeshua through the sacrifice. And it's only given um, a complete separation when those Gentiles who believe in Yeshua and repent of their sins come to him and are joined together with the Jewish people as one. That's the separation that is taken away by Yeshua. And I'm going to look a little bit at what, how Peter dealt with that whole question of Gentiles coming together with Jews in the first century after the coming of the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem at the Feast of, of Shavuot, the first Feast of Shavuot after Yeshua had ascended into heaven. So if you look at it in terms of the beloved coming together with the, the, her, sorry, the maiden coming together with her beloved, she needs to overcome the things that separate them. She's looking through a lattice work. She sees him, she hears his voice, but she can't touch him. She can't actually get to that place where she can hold him and she can actually feel his presence in a deep way. And when a Yeshua ascended into heaven, 
He, he was, the, the, the apostles witnessed him ascending into heaven. They couldn't touch him anymore. Do you remember Thomas touched him? Do you remember that they, they could see him? But they couldn't feel his presence once he had gone. But he said, he said, you know, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to send my Holy Spirit to be with you. And, and he will be the comforter. And he will be your counselor. And he will, he will do something in your day that will change the whole of the, the relationship between mankind as a whole, the world, and God. Because he will manifest himself in such a way that actually the Gentiles will come to believe in the God of Israel. Not in the God, any other God, but the God of Israel. In the, in the, 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 the manifest, through the manifestation of God in Yeshua, the Messiah, who is the sacrifice for all sins. And that, mani that manifestation absolutely changed society because previous to his Holy Spirit, then Gentiles were considered as dirty as dogs outside the kingdom of God. And actually, that was true. That's how it was, because... God had chosen the nation of Israel to be his representative on earth and he gave them sacrifices and, and uh, offerings to complete in the temple in Jerusalem so that they could have a relationship with God and then his plan was to bring Yeshua so that the Gentiles could join in with, in that relationship with God uh, in, a, in a very deep way, a spiritual way. And, and when we look at her looking through the lattice or over the wall, I don't know what translations you've got, but, but she is desperate, as we know, to, to be close to him. She's desperate to be near to him. And, she's, and there were many, many Gentiles who actually wanted to be close to the God of Israel. And, and they joined synagogues, some of them, and they became what we know as God-fearers, and they were desperate to be part of, of what God was doing amongst these people in Jerusalem because it was totally different to what they experienced in their nations who were worshipping many other gods. They were worshipping a you know, massive number of gods. And, and, and they wanted to get to know the one true God, but they couldn't access this one true God without a divine move of God. And, uh, and, and that takes us very quickly, you'll be pleased to know, to verse 10. And verse 10 says this, it says, it says, my beloved speaks and says to me, arise, my love, my darling, my fair one, and come away with me. The beloved, who is Yeshua for me, says, arise, arise, take action, do something. Because he's desperate that there would be a unification between man, between the Gentile and the Jew. Because God came for the world, didn't he? He didn't just come for the Jewish people. He, get, he came for salvation for the whole of the world. He just didn't come for one group of people. He came for everybody. The Jews were chosen, the apple of his eye, that they would be the messenger the, of, of this wonderful expression of, of God's love for the whole of mankind. And... Um, and, and, and we see the depth of that division and the anguish that Yeshua would have had uh, through uh, the, the experience of the poor man and Lazarus in Luke 16. And I don't need you to turn to it, but I'll remind you of the story. Lazarus is a poor man out who lives at the gate outside the rich man's house, who is Lazarus. And, 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 uh, sorry, the rich man. And Lazarus... Uh, begs, he's the poor man, he, he, he begs on the street there, he, he looks to the rich man for provision, and the rich man ignores, really, the plight of Lazarus, and then both die, because we all die, don't we, in the end, and, and, and we go to different places, and um, it depended on how your faith is and where your faith lies, it, 
And in, in, in Luke 16, 26, we see that Lazarus is with Abraham across an abyss. And he's standing with Abraham, and the rich man is on the other side of the abyss, and he's trying to get Lazarus to go back and tell his friends that there is an abyss. There is a separation in the spiritual realm between the believer and the non-believer, the, the people who follow the God of Israel and the people who don't, who are opposed to, to God. And, and, and those people who don't give to the poor and don't care for the needy and those people who do. And there is a, a division there he's trying to explain. And, um, and, and it says here in the verse 26 of Luke 16, besides all this, between you and us is a great chasm and that's been fixed so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so. No one can cross from there to us. So when we die, it's too late to seek your salvation. When we die, it's time is gone. It's the, 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 you're either on one side of the abyss or the other side of the abyss. And, and of course, Yeshua tells this story and he's lucky, he's, he's, he's ministering mainly to Israel because in Matthew 5 and Matthew 10, he's speaking directly to Israel. He says, in fact, he tells his disciples, listen, don't go to the, uh, to the Samaritans, go to the house of Israel, he says. Go to the lost sheep of Israel and minister to them. And, and that's what he does. But he also, in John 10, if we remember, in John 10, he says, I'm the good shepherd. He said, there are sheep from another sheepfold that I want to bring into this fold. And they will be one. And they will hear my voice. And he's speaking about the Gentiles. And he's specifically talking about having one flock and one shepherd. So he's, un he's speaking about how he will unify Jew and Gentile. And it's about faith. You can't be unified just because you go and live in Israel. You can't be unified just because you go to a synagogue. You can only be unified if you come into belief in Yeshua and into repentance of your sin in you, and recognizing Yeshua as the one who is the sacrifice and forgives sins, the only one who can forgive sins. And I think that's a, a very simple but true assessment, isn't it, of, of our faith. So that's how we are joined together. And, um, and we see here that, that, um, that in Shavuot, the reading of the law, the Torah, is connected to the experience of Moses on Mount Sinai. Because when they come out of Egypt and they come into the desert, they come into the wilderness, we read in, um, in Exodus 19 that Moses is going to be given, give, giving, uh, given a law by God, which is the one that Keith read out today, the Ten Commandments. But also after that, he's going to be given specific regulations, which I think are a reminder to the people that there is a coming Messiah and that God has always had a plan of redemption for humankind. And, and he, he lays this out in Leviticus 23, this divine regulation. But he says in uh, Leviticus 18.1, he says, you must separate from the people of Egypt and from the people that you're going to. And he says it in this way in Leviticus 18.1. He says, don't do as they do in Egypt and don't do as they do in the land of Canaan that I'm taking you to, but you must follow my decrees, my laws and my precepts, which he then sets out in Leviticus 23, which... Marion has just read. And this is the feast of, um, uh, of Shavuot and, and all the other feasts, the seven feasts, including Sabbath. And then uh, they reach Sinai. They come out of <coughs> Egypt and they get to Sinai. And God calls Moses up on the mountain. Now, if you don't turn to Exodus 19 because it'll take ages for us to read it. If we start reading Exodus 19 in the same way as I do the Song of Songs, we'll all be on crutches before we get out of here tonight. So I'm going to just skip through some of the verses, but you'll notice when I skip through these that God, when he speaks to Moses, makes sure there's a separation between him and the people. There's a separation between him and them. Uh, and 
it, it says in verse 7, um, sorry, verse 9, when he's talking to Moses about coming up the mountain, he says, Then the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to come to you in a dense cloud in order that the people may hear when I speak with you and so trust you ever after. But he, he, he wants the people to hear him, but he doesn't want the people to see him. And it's like the maiden. When we read this uh, scripture in, in um, Song of Songs 2 verse 10, he, she says, my beloved speaks to me. But she can't reach him. She can't get to him because of the wall and the lattice and the things that are separating him. Because at that time, she hasn't reached that place of holiness that the sacrifice of Yeshua brings when he um, uh, was crucified in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. She's not reached that place. And then um, uh, we see in verse 12 says, be careful not to go up to the mountain or touch the edge of it. Anyone who touches the mountain shall be put to death. No hand shall touch them. So God is saying, don't come up the mountain, guys. Your hands are not clean. Therefore, when we see the story of the rich man and Lazarus, we know that the rich man has no access to God after his death because of the abyss. Are you following me? Or am I? Yeah. So... Then we move on. We're still in 19, uh, Exodus 20. It says, uh, so, sorry, chapter 19, verse 20. It says, when the Lord descended upon Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, the Lord summoned Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Then the Lord said to Moses, go down and warn the people not to break through to the Lord to look. Otherwise, many of them will perish. S repeating the same principle that in our in our filthy state, in our sinful state, we cannot access the presence of God. The, the, it, it's a difficult message for people to get hold of uh, if they're not believers in Yeshua. It's, it's actually an offense to them, really. If you, People say, well, I believe in God. I go to church at Christmas and I go to church at Easter. The people say that, don't they, all the time? And, 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 and you know, I can access God, but actually the truth of it is is that unless they actually know Yeshua through repentance, they're not able to access God in that way. It's they're going to be on the wrong side of this abyss and this division, which is the division that actually Yeshua is talking about, which obviously is, a, is, is something he wants to destroy. And then, in, uh, verse, and then further on in the verse, it says, set limits around the mountain and keep it holy. You know... <laughs> One of the things that we have to understand is that, you know, you're speaking in a divine service. Take him to court. Ed, lock him up. <laughs> See you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. He's up all night, you know, working, and then he comes. He doesn't have hardly any sleep, does he, Keith? And then he comes and he looks after us, you know, but still we'll, he can use that as a defense, but we'll still charge him. Yeah. But there's this division, and, and, and we can't overcome that by just coming to church on a, on, a, on a Christmas time or an Easter time. We have to be in that place where we are actually pure and holy, not through our own works and not through anything that we do, but by the grace and the mercy of God who brings us into that place of separation and holiness when we repent and confess. I've done a lot of the gospel today, haven't I? Because, you know, because Shavuot is part of that story. It's, it's part of the narrative. So the, her beloved, um, uh, she, uh, sorry, the maiden, he is the beloved, but she can't touch him. She can't get there at all. She can't access him. Now, I don't know, if, verse, if you've got your Bibles open at verse... Um, 10 of chapter 2 of the Song of Songs, it says in my um, translation, it says, Arise, my darling. Has anyone got darling? Yeah. Who's got the phone? Who's got the phone? It's a chart, yeah. <laughs> Keith? <laughs> As a reformed man, you could. 
It says darling in my translation, but some translations say love my fair one. Who's got darling? Is that, what have you got, Nicole? Verse 10, yeah. Darling, you've got darling. Okay, right. Now, now he, yeah. My beloved, she, she can hear the voice of her beloved. She can hear him. And, and, and she says, my beloved speaks. So in spiritual terms, her beloved is God, the Yeshua, the Holy Spirit. And he speaks to her. And she can hear him. And, and, and many of you can hear, can't you, when God speaks? You, 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 clearly, Becky, she's gone now, is she? Yeah, can you charge her, Keith? Ed, <laughs> just make a note. Yeah, she's committed the same offense as Jane. You can go to court together, actually. <laughs> but we can hear the voice of God. Many people hear the voice of God, don't they? And, and, and we hear it, and that's why we give opportunity here for people to give a prophetic word, to, just to speak or to give a prophetic song, because we know that it's not, you know, it's not a, um, a, a, just the leadership who hear from God. It's everybody has access to hear the word of God. And, and, and then we see the words, Arise, my love, or arise, Nicolette, you've got darling, have you? Yeah. Shirley's got darling. Who else has got darling? I couldn't remember. No, darling, darling. So, have you, what, what translations are they? You, all in the NIV. Yeah. Okay. It, it's actually that's probably nearer the truth than some of even the one you man. Isn't that strange? I know that. <laughs> I know that. But I like that one new man Bible. But, but when we look at what, what it, the understanding of my love, my fair one, my darling is, what do you think it means? Who is the darling? The maiden? What's she like? He's in love with her. Yeah. But what's, what is the real meaning of this darling, my love? Well, it's, a stro- it's in Strong's. It means... The desolate one, the only child, the solitary one, and the beloved falls in love. The Messiah gives his life. God gives his only son for the solitary one, for the desolate, for the needy, for the hopeless. The one who has no worth in society. The one who is lost. He did all those things for you and I because in spiritual terms, we were lost. We, were, we had no value in the spiritual realm to, to, anything other than God, to anyone other than God. And God has always valued the soul of man. And she hears her beloved speak, and it's like a divine echo to her because she's so desolate in her life. She's so isolated. She's in a desert. She's lost. She's hurting. She's lonely. She's isolated. And she's desperate to hear the voice of God. How many of us have felt like that? How many of us have, been, have come into the kingdom because we felt like that? How many of us have actually listened to hear the voice of God when we're in that desperate place? And Shirley, what did you say to God? When you, I know I'm catching you off the hook, but I caught Keith off, off the hook as well again. What did, God, what did you say to God before you were saved? God, if you're there, speak to me. Was it? And what did he say? Did he say anything? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> he just set a series of events in, in place. Right. Can you come up? Can I have the microphone, Keith? Can you come up and just share that? God speaks in different ways, doesn't he? Do you want me to tell the story? Okay. Bad place, really fed up with life, feeling pretty um, hopeless. And I'd come to the point where I thought, why, what's the point of being alive? Because, you know, if man just seems to to be born and then to die, and 
So I, I remember saying to God, if you're there, God, if you're there, I want to know who you are. Otherwise, I don't see the point in carrying on life as it is right at the moment. And, um, and then a series of events just, just happened one after another. Um, the first one being that um, I was asked to go uh, with a, 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 a Christian family that I was deeply suspicious of um, on a skiing holiday. Um, and um, I'm really put on the spot here because this was 30 plus years ago. But um, a number of other things happened that certain things, I was able to give up smoking for the first time in in 20 years, uh, no, not quite 20 years, um, uh, at least 10 years I've been smoking and I, and I really wanted to give up and I just found that I was able to give up. And, and then um, I, um, I, I found, I went on, on this skiing trip and uh, met with this, this family and really, there was 22 people there and I was the only unbeliever. And, um, and I, you know, I, was, I was a drinker and I was a smoker and there was no drinking and no smoking there. So <laughs> it was a really real challenge, real in the face thing. And I was most uh, very uncomfortable. But then just a, a series of events, you know, I, I just responded. They started to worship and I, and I responded to it. I went looking for a decent book to read. And it was a Christian house. It was a, one of these big rambling residences full of corridors and little bookcases everywhere with gospel books in. And I kept ignoring the gospel books until I found one which I, I opened up and it had a bit of you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll in it. And I thought, well, this'll do. <laughs> you have no idea, you know. <laughs> and um, so I started to read it, but it was a testimony of, of a woman just like me. <laughs> and, uh, and so I began to read this. And then really another, a num another of, number of other issues just, just, just slotted into place. I can't quite recall quickly enough to tell you. But it was just like that. I knew God was speaking to me. But the biggest one that I remember was that somebody said, you need a Bible. You need to read the Bible. And I went, I don't want to read the Bible. Um, get a Bible. And I, I went and... Um, Actually, I'm not sure that that's exactly true. Um, I just know that I was in the high street in Harrow, and um, I found myself, I was going back to the car park, and I found myself in the middle of W.H. Smith, and I was there in this bookshop, and I couldn't understand why I was there, but I was there, and, um, and I realized I needed to buy a Bible. And, and, and I bought the Good News Bible, I didn't know what else. Honestly, I held this Bible like this. <laughs> and I sort of put it on the desk. <laughs> it, was, it was like it was a dirty magazine, really. <laughs> because I was so embarrassed and so I couldn't believe that I was actually buying a Bible. Anyway, you know, that, it's just those sort of things that happened that God spoke to me in that way. He said, I've got my hand on you and I'm not going to let you go. And eventually I just came through to, to believing and trusting in him and getting forgiven and cleansed from a lot of sin. And, um, and I'm here now. So, so God brings us close through speaking and she... He, that the, the beloved hears this now. When we look at Acts 2, what we're seeing there, and you all know what, what, you all have an understanding of Acts 2, I guess, looking around. Everybody has an understanding of Acts 2, do they? With the Holy Spirit coming on the, on the, on the Jewish community who have come in to celebrate the Feast of Shavuot. And they, they are remembering that when... Moses had just been a few weeks leading the Israelites in the desert. He went on Mount Sinai and took the law of God. They were reading the law of God. And as Yeshua had promised, when before he ascended, that he would send his Holy Spirit to be with them, then his word was fulfilled because the Holy Spirit of God, who had, had, had been... Um, uh, Something that the Jewish people really desired and were passionate to, to, to have amongst them 
met with those Jewish believers. Now, I say they were passionate and, and wanted the Holy Spirit to come because we know that's a historical fact because when we read the story of the Essenes and when we receive, re read other Qumran community writings, we know that they are desperate for the Holy Spirit to come. It's not a church creation. It wasn't something that was new in the first century. We can't... Uh, uh, Gentile Christianity, or Christendom as we call it, the, can't lay claim to the Holy Spirit. He's the Holy Spirit of the God of Abraham, Isaac, Isaac and Jacob. And uh, he, he came and met and I, with the people who were there celebrating this feast and listening to the law of Moses being read in Jerusalem. And they are there because they want God. They were there because they were passionate for God. And it says that they were Jewish people who were born again at that moment. They received the Spirit of God. And as we know from uh, Jeremiah, the, spirit, the law went from their head to their hearts. And Ezekiel 36, it was like a sprinkling of fresh water from the heavens upon the, the hearts and the souls of those Jewish believers who traveled all that way to meet with him. And, and, and those 3,000 went back and they, they went back to their synagogues. Now, can you imagine the change in the synagogues? Maybe in Crete, maybe in Ephesus, in Corinth, Colossus. Can you imagine those Jews going back to the synagogue, now spirit-filled, Instead of falling asleep in the service now or walking out, they're actually wide awake and passionately listening to the preacher speaking. <laughs> but they are filled with the Spirit of God. Now, let, let, we haven't got much of a record, Keith, of what they were doing in Crete, have we, at that time? It, there's not, there's not, a lot of, not a lot of writing about that. But if we look at what was happening to Peter and the apostles in Jerusalem, then we can assume that actually God was moving amongst them. Because what was happening to Peter and the apostles after the um, move of the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem in Acts 2, shortly after the ascension, what were they doing? They were walking up to the temple and even their shadow was healing the sick. They were laying hands on people and they were being healed. The power of God was working through them in a way that couldn't have happened before the presence of the Holy Spirit amongst them. Because in the physical realm, we can't heal the sick. We can't actually do anything. We can't enter into the presence of God. It's like as if we're at the bottom of a mountain and we can't get up to the top of the mountain, isn't it? it, it there's, there's something between us. And that doesn't mean that we're not saved because I believe people who really believe but haven't been fully Holy Spirit filled, uh, they still saved. That's what I believe. I mean, Shirley preached on that, didn't you? Do you, I don't know whether you agree or not, but, but there are sincere believers who aren't filled with the Holy Spirit, who, who still have salvation because they've repented and they believe in Yeshua. That, that isn't the problem. But the, the thing is that, that being, being, being empowered by the Holy Spirit enables the gifts that God gives us to be... Uh, manifested in a much deeper and stronger way and this, this uh, divine call or this echo from the heavenly realm to the person who really seeks and finds the Holy Spirit is met in the soul in a way that it, it builds them up and strengthens them and their faith deepens and deepens and deepens. And, and as with the, ma the maiden, she is so desperate to get over this wall, to get through to the beloved, and because she can hear him. And, and what's he saying to her? He's saying, arise, arise, my darling, arise, arise, my desolate one, arise, my lonely, my isolated one, come out of that place and join with me, your beloved the one who gives you and fulfills the needs of the deepest crevasses of the soul. And, and, and that's what we want, isn't it? When, you know, if you've experienced that place where Shirley was at or where I was at and a lot of you were at, then, then it's your soul 
that needs feeding, that needs something deep to, to fill and to feed and to, to, to provide the desperate uh, uh, desire to be in the presence of God. And that can only come about by the Holy Spirit. It can only be, be satisfied by the presence of God. And the lack of, the removal of the division between us and God, the division between Jew and Gentile, the divisions between ourselves. And, and, um, and this whole manifestation of the soul being filled with the love of God and us being able now to arise from the place we were in, now to begin to walk up a mountain, to meet with God at the top of the mountain, to be in his presence so that we won't perish as we enter into his presence. We won't, then nothing will come between us. We won't be th uh, thrown aside, that we'll be part of a family, a spiritual family of God, which is made up of Jew and Gentile, who have the, the power to make a difference, not only in our own lives, but make a difference in the lives of others. And, and we see that in Ephesians 2, Paul talks about this coming together, Jew and Gentile together as this one new man, coming together as a spiritual entity that will change the face of the earth. And you know, as Jill spoke so well, she's speaking so well about the, the church history and how it changed, then what came between us, what came to stop that move was man who actually built up a wall between us and the Jewish people. And actually, that, that is the wall that we're trying to break down today. The wall that separates the, uh, uh, the, the believer who follows the Jewish Messiah and the believer that follows, in inverted commas, the Palestinian Ar Arab Messiah, who is taught, and Ed and Jill will tell you, and Chris Proudlove, taught by um, theologians from Bethlehem, and other places today, which is the same teaching that's been taught for years, for hundreds and hundreds of years, that actually we are separate from the Jewish people. That is what has removed the power from the church because the Holy Spirit can't touch something that isn't true. When we say we're worshipping in spirit and truth, what are we doing? We're worshipping in the truth of the scriptures and the truth that we are joined together and the separation wall has been taken away. The maiden now has access to the beloved. She's able to have access to him. And, um, and, 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 and no longer is she alone. No longer is she that darling, that, that separated one. No longer have you need... Do you need or any of us need to feel alone or separated? We are now in a spiritual family. I, I can't get this when people say, I don't go to church anymore. Because we're a family, it's like saying, I'm not going to go and see my family. You know, we, I'm not going to. I'm not going to be a part of my family. You know, whether you, you we've got Jews here and Gentiles come together. Um, we're a family. In, in Yeshua, we're one. You know, we miss you when we're away. I don't know whether you miss us, but we miss you when you're away. I, I, I know that we do because we're family. And in fact, you know, I've got a big family, but I feel, and I've got to say this, the way families are, we're quite close. We all live in the same area and we help. We, me and Shills went over to my sister's. Her husband is, is 80 and he's got lung cancer. We go there and help a little bit. And we're still family, but you know I feel closer to, to you guys here somehow in the speech because it's a spiritual thing. We speak on the same level. We're, it, I love you. But I tell you what, God loves you more. And this feast is a celebration of the love that we have between us. And no longer are you alone. There's no need for a true believer to be alone anymore. There's not. I mean, we have God. And what did Yeshua say when he said he was going to send the Holy Spirit? I'm not going to leave you as orphans. 
So don't go look back on the time when you were an orphan. You're in a family. We're in a family. Psalm 2, 22, 20 says, Deliver me my soul from the sword. My darling, it says in the King James Version of this psalm, it says, my darling, meaning my lonely one, my desolate, from the power of the dog. Well, the dog in Scripture is who? The Gentiles. We're no longer Gentiles. We're no longer Jew. We're, you know, the power of the dog will destroy us. We, we, I just had a message last night. We've just lined up a hidden treasures course in a, a hall up in Lancashire. You know, we do them. Mark Owen and he was going to do them. I was going to help him. Well, I had a message from Mark last night to say somebody had written a letter of complaint about the course because it's connected to Israel. So this hall now of, uh, of abandoned, well, they, what they've said is we are now um, not going ahead with this, this course. So, but that is, the, that is the nature of the spiritual battle we're in. I, I don't carry a burden for that because I recognize, you know, I've lived with that now for nearly 20 years. I, it, I just recognize that we just have to keep going. We just have to look for somewhere else. We just have to push on and go to the next place and, and, and try and move on because we have to get this message out that actually God is the God of Israel. We have to get that message out. We have to get the message out that the, Israel is the fulfillment of the prophets and, and that Yeshua is coming back to Israel. That he's, you know, that's, and we're going to do everything we can and we have to get the message out that Sabbath is the day, not Sunday. And some people might say, oh, that's legalist. You know, I've just, I'm going, I, I, I did this kind of research a few years ago about Saturday and, and learned all that stuff that I taught that Judith was in, absolutely enthralled with about the conventicles and John James being executed and all these. But, but, I, but I've realized that actually not much research has been done in Wales. So I'm looking at what's happening in Wales and I've only just started and I've, been in the Flintshire archivists and I'm going to Denbyshire now. I spoke to the archivists there. I'm involved with the Chester archivists. And they, when I say to them, when they say, what can we help you with? And I say, I'm, look, I want to look at clandestine marriages, conventicles act, uh, <laughs> the five mile act and, uh, um, and, and, and the, the church history. They say, what? <laughs> what? But when you look, they've got quite a lot of detail there. You know, if you look at the courts, the assizes and the, the, the consistory courts, actually it's full of information, as we've seen from these scrolls. It's there. And you know these people who say, oh, Saturday is legalistic. I tell you what, I tell you something right there, Saturday is so freeing. Yeah. It is. And Sunday is bound up with all these acts from the church that actually drags people to court because they don't attend church. You know that the, the um, Act of Uniformity in 1549 set in place punishment if you didn't turn up to church on a Sunday. And you were fined 12p, which is not a lot today, is it? It wouldn't buy anything today, would it? But it was, it was £11 then. And if you married outside the church in the 18th century, then you had to pay a bond of £100. Now, in the 18th century, £100 is a lot of money. Or you are considered to be a fornicator. Because if you don't marry inside the church, you're not married in the eyes of the church. And therefore, when you look at those things that I've given you, Keith and uh, Jane and, and Keith, you'll see there that there are people dragged up to the consistory court in Chester because of fornication or clandestine marriage, or whatever. So don't tell me that we're in legalism. It's absolute rubbish. Look at the history. Look at the history of Sunday. You know, come with me and spend a couple of days in the archives. I'd love you to. I, Becky, where is she? <laughs> dear, dear. But, but it's the truth. It's absolutely the truth. Psalm 25, 16 says, I'm in the K King James a lot today, but turn thee unto me and have mercy upon me, for I'm desolated and afflicted. You know, at that 
feast of Shavuot 2,000 years ago when the Holy Spirit came. I'll have to move very quickly now. The Holy Spirit came. You know, there is no need for Gentiles to feel desolate or aliens anymore. As Paul said, we are not aliens now. We are co-citizens with Israel. We're part of that move, that spiritual move. And then there are other Psalms that I've got here that I've made note of that says that, you know, the desolate person has now found a home in the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But what I want to do is in the last couple of hours I've got left, is to look <laughs> at, at this joining together of, of Jew and Gentile, which was misunderstood by Peter, particularly, but by the early apostles. And it, it's in Acts 10. And, and I, I, I'm not going to read it, because we haven't got long enough to read it. But I'll tell you the story. Peter's now had this... Um, amazing experience of these 3,000 Jews being filled by the Holy Spirit. He's there in Jerusalem and he's told he's got to go to the house of Cornelius who is a Gentile. And Cornelius has also had a message that he is a Gentile now. He's going to get a visit from a Jew who's going to tell him about the Jewish Messiah and they're going to get together. And Cornelius actually is thinking, hey, a Jew's not going to come into my house. He, he knows that he's not going to come in. And Peter's saying, you know what, I'm not going to go into the house of a Gentile because they're dirty, they're unclean. I'm not going in there. And he's talking spiritually. It doesn't mean that a Gentile cleans the house more than a Jewish person does. But, but he, he's talk, they're talking in spiritual realm. The whole thing is about a spiritual experience. And, and Peter's told to go to Cornelius' house, and God knows that Peter's going to get there and say, on your bike, mate, I am not coming in. I'll speak to you in the garden, but I'm not coming into the house. So, so Peter sleeps on a roof. He goes on a roof of a house on his way to see Cornelius because he's walking. Trains have stopped. There's accidents on the road. So he's walking out and, he, and he's, he stays overnight and he gets a vision of me, unclean meat, unclean food in a blanket, doesn't he, on, or on a sheet. And most people in Christendom say, oh, that's telling Peter he can eat unclean. What a load of rubbish. It's not at all. God is trying to show Peter that Cornelius is made clean by the Holy Spirit and repentance of sin through Yeshua. And, and, and that's, what, that's what God is trying to tell Peter, that what, what God can do is to make the unclean clean. Now, praise God for that because that concept works for me 100%. That principle has helped me through my life and through my faith for the last 20 odd years from the time Ada brought me into faith because I recognize how unclean I was. Not only was I a Gentile, although I don't know whether I am a Gentile or a Jew, but it doesn't matter. But not only was I. That, but I'm unclean. I now can be made clean by the God of Israel, by the Holy Spirit. What an amazing, just relief. Don't you think so? Yes. Just an amazing uh, spiritual um, gift from God. It's just absolutely fascinating that God would actually do that for us in a way that we don't have to work for it. We just have to believe and, and be convicted by the Spirit of God. Allow him to convict our hearts. And, he, and so he's saying this to Peter. And Peter then goes off to Cornelius' house. They have a talk. They're in the house. I would think they would be... Uh, Cornelius would have made him welcome. They would have shared about the Lord. They would have told the story. And, and, and they would have recognized that they were made one. And that the Holy Spirit was amongst them. And then Peter, then realizing this, goes back to the church in Jerusalem. You'll see it in Acts 11. Goes back to the church in Jerusalem and he says, hey, guess what? The Gentiles now are made clean by the Holy Spirit. Anyone who comes into faith in Yeshua now is not separated from God, but is actually part of the family. I just think that is absolutely wonderful, isn't it? But one of the uh, things that is really important about the, the, the Feast of Shavuot is very often missed during 
any teaching on Shavuot. And that is the last verse, the verse 22. Um, in, what is 22? I know what it is, but can someone read it? Pam, can you read it for me? No, move your jack to the queen there. That's it. Yeah, okay. That's it. <laughs> Sorry, Pam. <laughs> no. There we are, thank you. Yeah, just 22, please. And when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest, neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord your God. Thanks, Pam. Thank you. Thank you. Now, that verse is not usually read. I've looked at a lot of teachings on Shavuot over the years, and actually that's missed out, but it's, it's probably one of the most important parts of the whole celebration, that we look after the poor. What that verse says to the people of Israel at the time is that, you know, it's the time of the wheat harvest. Passover was the time of the barley harvest, Barley is not a good crop as wheat, so wheat is the best of the crop. It's the wheat harvest, the Shavuot. Uh, it's the richest of the harvest. And remember when Yeshua actually referred to this feast when he said, uh, you know, if, if wheat doesn't fall to the ground, then nothing will grow. Then um, it, it's, it's a special time. And, 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 and it says, what it's saying to the people of Israel is, actually, this crop that you think is yours is not yours. It's mine. And I choose to give part of this crop to the poor. I actually choose at this feast to remind you that you should be giving it to the poor. And why does he do that? Well, if you look at, at the whole story, the poor are poor in spirit, whether you're Jew and Gentile. God brings nourishment from the spirit to the soul of man that he can or she can enter into the presence of the beloved without the wall or the lattice that separates them. What a lovely picture. For us today, we can, can in this very wealthy life that we have, and we do have a wealthy life, we can share it with the poor, and that's why we have the, um, the, the meal tonight, because of the children in Myanmar, they have nothing. I can tell you, they are really poor. It was a, it was a good thing that God sent us there, because it's, I was living in a bit of a cocoon about life until I saw these children and saw the pastors there and just saw how poor they were living. But, and it made me realize more than anything that we do have to give to the poor and we do have to give. And, and you know, I, I'll just throw this in now. When you look at the work that Sarah Rossiter is putting in with these cakes, this girl is filled with the Spirit of God and understands the Scriptures from a, 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 uh, a natural way. It's in her. It's absolutely in her. And she was delighted, I think, Shirley, when she's making the cakes for tonight. It's, you know, she's just like, we can, we can rest assured that, you know, there are people in the next generation and the generation after that that are going to take this message of God's love to the world in a way that we probably couldn't do. You know, so keep praying for these children. But Leviticus 19.10 says, You shall not strip your vineyard bare or gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. And then Deuteronomy 10.18 says, says who He is the God who executes justice for the orphan and for the widow. In the same way like the orphan with the maiden. And, and who loves the strangers, providing food and clothing. He loves the Gentile and the Jew. Deuteronomy 15, 7 to 8 says, If there is among you anyone in need, a member of your community, and in any of your towns within the land that the Lord your God has given you, do not be hard-hearted, and I like this, or tight-fisted toward your needy neighbor. You should rather open your hand willingly, lending enough to meet the need whenever it may be. 
I, and I've got a lot of scriptures here for, about this, but, but it, the last one I'll use is be, it's Deuteronomy 15.9, and it's in the New Revised Standard Version, and it says this, Be careful that you do not entertain a mean thought. Isn't that, shall I repeat it? Be careful that you do not entertain a mean thought. And Luke 14 says, you know, invite the poor to the banquet. Now, we're going to have communion now. And um, we've had it now because I wanted to say this, if it's okay. God sent his son to die for unity between the Jew and the Gentile. He sent his son to die that the soul of man could be fed and nourished by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that brings comfort, that brings life to us, that brings peace to us. You know, our soul cannot find peace. This maiden hasn't got peace while she's looking through the lattice. She will only find peace when she's in the arms of her beloved, when there's nothing between them. And you know in Christendom, like in every other organization and every other faith, there is division. There are things that come between us because we're living amongst us. And I felt the Lord saying, you know, if there's anything between any of us, just put it right before you come to this table. Because like being on the mountain, we can't enter to the height of the Holy Spirit, the heights that he wants to take us when when he says to us, arise, my darling, my beloved, my fair one. He can't take us to that higher level in the spiritual realm. Why there is problems between us and others, whether it's in the congregation or outside the congregation, we have to put it right. And and, and it doesn't matter whether it's somebody in your past or in your present or in your future, far away, near, close. In the spiritual realm, there's no distance. Now, God so loved the world that he sent his son that there would be unity in spirit, one Holy Spirit. Let's see if we can just put for a moment, can you go and play, show me something? Put for a moment, a moment aside to say in our hearts if we have anything at all against anybody at all that we would put it right so that we would come to this table and take this bread and this wine which represents the body and the blood of Yeshua which the body is the word of God, the law that Keith read tonight, love thy, today, love thy neighbor. Love God with all your heart. Don't have murderous thoughts. Don't have thoughts that are bad. Don't be mean in thought and spirit. Just let's put it all aside, shall we? And let's just ask God to forgive us and move forward and and take the bread, which I've said is the Torah, and the wine, which is a representation of the forgiveness that comes when we break the Torah and we're, we're not able to, uh, to, to rise above things, that we will actually come to this place, to this table in a new way. And let's do that every time we have communion. But let's, if we've got a problem with somebody, let's just deal with it. Because God is a God that brings unity. Two loaves, Gentile, Jew, brought together as an offering before God. As a harvest of souls that can walk up a mountain with our beloved and be on the mountain top with our God. Can we do that? Let's just take a moment. Yeshua's name.